And so a little while, I've been maybe 15 minutes sitting at the table, trying to explain what took place in the, in the urinal room. A bottle of wine arrived, and it was from Mark Clark. And he must have known that there was some argument going on at the table. And I know he wrote his name, and after it, he just wrote one word, proof. And I, I remembered that for a long time. So we, you know, shared this bottle. And in my own probably drunken <laughs> state I was in gradually, I think the waiter took it, you know, when it was over. And then they started sending me around the world. India, Japan, the Philippines, mm -hmm. back to Brazil, Italy, southern France. And then uh, one day aboard ship in the Mediterranean, my head officer said to me, Eddie, they want you upstairs, not upstairs, but up in the hospital section. And so I went up to the hospital because they were short of staff. We were now taking very injured men and women, mostly men, who were very amputated plus, arms, legs. And I guess they were doing this to give them a long, quiet voyage home. Anyway, they asked me to go to a certain stateroom and take a big, big dish. They had big dishes. They were from the kitchen. Steel, you know, pots. And a bar of soap and cloths. I mean, I was really loaded down for a youngster. And I went into the stateroom and I didn't know what I was going to see, but it was a lot of unwashed, because they'd been in line on the wharf waiting to board, and I had to give them all bath, like sponge baths. But without thinking stupidly, I said, how is everybody? And I almost fainted was the smell. Anyway, that's what I did. Bathed them all. And uh, they kept sending me different places. I'd no sooner get there and they, well, I know I tried to get to Australia got as far as Darwin. And I was on what they call on board duty that day. I couldn't get off. And the officer who was in charge, he was not a, he wasn't too wonderful. I remember and I, I said, oh, just let me get on the wharf, because that, that's Australia. This is not Australia. <laughs> I, I, I've never been here. <laughs> so I just thought, for God's sakes, go down, come back, hurry up. His name was Apple. He was a mean cuss. Anyway, he let me go down, down the ramp to the, I was on soil. <laughs> Darwin, it was just a few, like shacks, that's all. And the war was over, but it was really poor. And 
then I know I went to where? Oh, back to Norfolk, Virginia, before the end of the war in Japan. That was it. And we had nothing to throw. We didn't have confetti and things like that. We threw rolls of toilet paper. I was sitting on the front right-hand side of a car. It was very hot. The motor, you know, from the motor was very hot, burning my ass. And that's how Japan, you know, signed the documents that day or so they're going to or whatever. But the war was now considered over with Japan. I know that there are a lot of other things I might have told you, but some I don't want to remember. So how, how, what was it like to go from that to then decide Well, I got a job in a factory to earn some money. I worked at Montgomery Ward, packing clothes for shipment to people. And then I did some office work for a secretary store. I don't remember much about that. But I had these two jobs. And then I decided to go. It meant leaving my young sister and my mother. And I bought my ticket on, you know, my first airplane ride. TWA. Constellation. Had to buy new luggage and clothes. Spent a lot of money. But I was a walking bandbox of fashion. And I found a room in Fort Washington, Upper Manhattan. The man was with the New York Philharmonic, a violinist, and he had just finished. And his wife, who made wonderful Viennese Hungarian food. And I lived there for like two years, maybe two and a half. And I got to school. I had an audition to get into school. It was on 57th Street in the tower of Carnegie Hall at that time, 1947. I was taking one class, one phase of classes from nine in the morning until noon, and at the end of my first two days, they said, can we get you to take second year already? Can you do both? I said, sure I can. So I studied from nine to one, then I had lunch, a half hour, and then from 1.30 or two o'clock to seven, I took part two, and I did that for a year, and I got through it in a year, instead of doing it in two years. I was thrilled, so thrilled. I even had gone to my first audition early in those years. It had to be in the late 40s. I auditioned for a Cole Porter musical. Q 
Kiss Me Kate. I was in seventh heaven. I was the second one at the audition. You know, they, they tore down the theater that that took place in, and now there are apartment buildings there. But it was just, it was a wonderful time in the late 40s, or early 50s in New York City. It's quite changed a great deal. Well, I got that far. And then one day someone said to me, why don't you go see the Berghoff studio and take more acting classes? I said, who needs them? I graduated. It's a terrible conceit to say that, but that's what I did. Anyway, I went. And I found myself so thrilled learning about honesty and truth and acting that I joined. And I met wonderful people whom I still know to this day, at least those that are alive. What's next? Oh, no. So that's when you met Herbert and Uta and all Right. Them. How was that? Did, did you know who they were? Well, I knew who she was better than I knew who he was. I knew her because I've seen her in film, Uta. Uta Hagen was in Streetcar, Name Desire, and she had replaced another actress, and she, she was teaching, finally. And then, years later, he said to Mr. Berghoff said to me, you should study with Uta Hagen. And I said, you have to be kidding. You have to audition to get in her class. Am I ready? And I heard from way in the very back of the studio Uta Hagen's voice. Oh, yes, Eddie, I love you in class. Please come. I've seen your work in class. You can study with me. Well, I was so overwhelmed. I believe I cried. Anyway, I began studying with her. And she gave me a scholarship, which meant that I didn't have to pay for any classes. And five years later, she said to me, what did you do this summer? I said, oh, excuse the expression. I was directing two plays. She said, really? Why don't you teach here? I said, you got to be out of your effing mind. Well, I didn't say effing. I said the real McCoy. And I ended up beginning my class September 20th, 1957. September 20th, 1947 was the day I arrived in New York. Ten years. And so I began teaching. And like Mr. Sondheim said, I'm still here. Still teaching. And so how, how did you find Uta as a teacher? Was she tough? Tough, oh, yes. Brutally honest. Told the best dirty jokes you've ever heard. She was unscrupulous about detail. She could criticize you for a long period of time, and she refused to make it a long period of time. She said very little, but it was sometimes very scathing. And you just had to solve it 
and bring in an exercise that solved that problem. I wish I could remember that. I remember doing a lot of exercises, but I don't always remember exactly what problem we're talking about now, because I had a lot of mistakes. I always ended up saying, if you want to learn about theater, study with Herbert Berghoff. If you want to learn about acting, separate, you had to study with Uta. A wonderful teacher. To this very day, many of us who are still teaching there, we all used to be in the same class at one time, and we laugh about it and how scared we were. And we praised her for her honesty in the end. In the beginning, we thought, Jesus, she must hate me. And she didn't. She really cared because she saw how much you cared. And she, <laughs> she spoke her mind. We didn't always like it because we were still immature, even though World War II had finished and we got through that. But now we have our own new kind of battle. And it was Uta Hagen's class. What was the most difficult exercise you had to do with her? Well, it's her exercise. They were her exercises. And to this very day, they're in her two books that she wrote, very simple exercises, very simple, come into a room for a reason, find your objective, and use your own circumstances and your background and find your consequences. But she made you answer questions and all of those answers had to be done physically until you were allowed to talk. So your, your whole program had to be executed. And if you didn't fulfill that plan, you had to do it over. She gave me an exercise one day, and I had to do it for every class. Every class she taught, I had to do that again until I got it right. In fact, on the 10th week, and there was only one more week to study, she said, Oh, good, you finally did it. Good for you, Eddie. Just do it once more to make sure it wasn't luck. I heard a groan from the class, because they were so tired, watching Eddie trying to solve what they thought was so simple. But it wasn't. That's just one day at her class to do the work. Now it's, I'm blessed by it. Thank you. <laughs> how was, um, how was, how was working with, with Herbert? Because you, you, I remember you saying about him being even more brutal. Ooh. And also how he brought in white people to go. Yes. We had a wonderful actor in our group, William Hickey. And Bill was asked to be in a play by Herbert. And then he got a job on Broadway, and they had to find a replacement for the workshop. And Herbert asked me to do it, and was waiting for Godot. Well, I read the script, I said, well, this is almost impossible to figure out what the hell this is about. I don't even know who I am. All that blabbering, and I said, God, this is hard. So we started work.
for 10 hours a day, sometimes 12, we had rehearsal. Seven days a week. I mean, it was totally illegal. What do you care? You wanted to work on this play. And I had a three-page speech. The character's name is Lucky. In the first act alone. And then they beat me with a stick or something, I remembered. And I stopped talking. There was a wonderful actor in our company. His name was Robert Culp. And he was in a television show eventually, very big. I Spy, I believe it was called. I hope I'm right. Well, we did that for 11 months rehearsal. 11 months, one play. We were all beginning to, to snap because we just went to rehearsal. I had no job. I was living on a bowl of soup. And that's not a lie. And then finally we said, Herbert, we, we're all falling apart because we love working, but we have no support. There's no money. Uh, we were just working on this workshop. He said, well, we'll open. We are opening. So my God, we have the date and so forth. And all of a sudden, they said, Luther's coming, Luther's coming. I said, who's Luther? Luther Adler. Stella Brother. Stella was a very fine actress who had her own studio. And her brother was a friend of Herbert's. He came and was the only audience. And when we finished, I don't think I've ever been kissed so much. Squeezed, kissed, hugged. Well, that began our one-year run in this old studio on 6th Avenue, way up there. And then uh, Uja said to me in class one day, she said, so-and-so was here. I said, oh, really? She said, you know, they came to our house after the show. I said, oh. Do you know they wouldn't talk about anything else except you? I said, really? What did they say? Really expecting, you know, that I had done something really bad. They said, it was the most depraved moment, the most depraved actor they'd ever seen. Depraved. <laughs> because I made him like a dog, almost, in my interpretation. <laughs> that was... One of the strange events. And then Uta Hagen wanted to do a German play about Chinese people, The Good Woman of Setsuan. And I auditioned for the old. Oh, that was a scandal. A 
man was producing it, bought the rights, and was going to do it in Florida with a different director and the star, Bert Lahr, whom I knew. And finally, it all fell apart somehow. I guess it was Tom Ewell and Bert Lahr were in it. Anyway, it fell apart. Herbert was interviewed for the job and ended up directing it for Broadway. The producer wanted someone else for the role of Lucky. And it went to him. And then I went to opening night. I went to the opening night party, waiting for the reviews. They were mixed because it was such strange material for Broadway. Bert Lahr was sensational. And after, afterwards, after the play ended, everybody from, from the studio was there. And, uh, I can't even think of his name now. Oh dear. Why did I go there? If I can. Montgomery Clift. His coach was there. She had taught at the studio, I believe. Not in my classes. I mean, not where I was taking class, but she was on the faculty. And she asked Herbert very loudly at the table at Sardi's. Why did you not put this young man in? She said he's sensational. And Herbert explained to her about the producer wanted another actor. And she said, oh, well, she said, he was like nothing I'd seen. So she, she had to leave. I know I remember her, her leaving. And everybody thought she was leaving in a huff. You know, kind of, she didn't get her way or something. She couldn't do anything about it. I mean, that's, but I remember that evening very well. And of course, the play went on, it was wildly criticize both good and bad, and people couldn't understand it, and so forth. But strangely enough, many moons later, and I don't know the, the time sequence, the woman who was in charge of HB Studio at the time, Philippa Hastings, was from Britain. She was in charge of the school office. And she said, I've been invited with my friend to go have supper at Montgomery Cliff's residence. He had a townhouse on the east side somewhere. She said, I'd like you to come along. The chef is wonderful. She's such a funny woman. You'll love her. So we, we were, you know, planning to go. That very evening that we were to go, they found him having committed suicide in his house. That was so memorable that, you know, we were going to go and eat in the kitchen because this cook was a friend of hers and so forth. It's a strange story. 
just very peculiar. Mm. So, I remember you told me once that you, you met um, Cole Porter. Oh, yes. That was a very, very thrilling, thrilling incident. I have to go back now in the years sometimes. I wish I remember all these dates. Oh, sorry. Yeah. At the time of meeting Mr. Porter, I was living in an apartment house on West 10th Street, and Sal Hurok, the producer, booked for the first time in America Sadler Wells Ballet Company and was selling tickets in advance and none of us could go, it was too expensive. But one of the men in our group was a young doctor and he said, well, what would happen if I order the tickets and over the months before the show, you pay me back, each of you. You're having a little account. So we thought, oh, yeah, that's good. So, you know, $10, $5. I must tell you that back in the 50s, life was a little easier. Anyway, you pick the day, and you pick the ballet you wanted to see and the time. And one day, I was the only one going, like let's say a Friday night or a Saturday night. So I was in the box all alone. I knew I was going to be alone. I wouldn't know anybody. So I was sitting in box number 31. I remember to this day. And I saw Cinderella with Maura Shearer. And Michael Holmes, I think. Yes. Anyway, the, at the end of Act One, there was a lot of noise coming from this door. And it was Elsa Maxwell, George Howe, the author, and Cole Porter. Well, I, thought, I just thought I'd pee in my britches. And they no sooner got in than Elsa Maxwell and George Howe wanted to go for, to the bar. The intermissions were quite long, if I remember. Anyway, I heard Cole Porter say, no, I'll stay here. Well, the minute they left, I'm sitting in a lower section on the, at the front. It's the old net. And the steps very short in the box. I said, Mr. Porter, why don't you sit here and I'll just sit on this level here. He said, thank you very much. Because he could spread his legs out, you know, because he ended up having 35 operations or 32 or something like that. Anyway, you know, we'd, we were sitting there he said, how is it? I'm sorry we're late, but you know. <laughs> he just, you know. <laughs> he was not mentioning names. Anyway, he asked me what I did. I told him I was an acting student, where I studied, who I studied with, and that I sold books to make a living in a bookstore. And I told him I had auditioned for one of his shows and they didn't like me and he laughed. So anyway, you know, I said I live downtown and I'm in the village and he said, you know, we have a, I have a car, you know, we'll, we could drop you. I said, oh no, I'm going downtown said, I'll walk. I'm going down Fifth Avenue. Anyway, the show came to an end and 
we said good night. I had told my name and everything where I lived. So I lived downtown on Mineta Street. And I had to go up a lot of stairs. I'm on the fifth floor, fourth floor, whatever it was. And my phone is ringing. You know, it's one o'clock in the morning. And I answered the phone call. It was Cole Porter. We talked for maybe almost, well, an hour and a half, two hours maybe. Just talk, talk, talk about everything. And he said, you know, you can give me a call. He actually gave me his number. He lived in the tower uh, at the Waldorf, next to the, in the Waldorf, but it's, you know, separate was the residence, I take it. It's the tower. I was invited there to a party. I mean, I, I never went to that kind of party in my life. There were so many famous people. You just inhaled. And that's how you stayed the rest of the evening. Because it was just, oh my god, oh my god, look. Oh. You know, and you're trying to pretend like it's nothing. You know, because you're very sophisticated. But everybody was in black tie. I was not. I was just in a dark suit. I had been instructed to wear a dark suit. He was very nice about it, and he spoke to me briefly when I got there. But I didn't talk to him much that evening. I was just talking to people that were in show business. And then I heard them get into a discussion about Richard Rogers. Richard Rogers had said to him on the phone, because he couldn't come to the party with his wife, Something about, this is the end of an era. Our kind of music will not be in shows much longer. It will all become rock and roll, that kind of music. People go, oh, no, don't say that, no. Well, he was right. The whole music industry changed little by little. One night, and I don't know who it was, I mean, as proof, I don't know. I got a call to please come and visit Mr. Porter. And so I went, and I really wasn't nicely dressed, because I said, I'm not well dressed, I, I have, you know, I just... Anyway, I think it was somebody who worked for him, who was very hardly talkative if you were there. Well, I don't know, we talked for about, I don't know, three, four hours, falling asleep, waking up. But he was not well. <coughs> It was the last time I was to see him. I believe he died in the early 60s. But he had, when he was in a, Indiana, and I remember because that's my father's birthplace. That's why I remember it. He was somewhere in Indiana years before, and a tree fell on him. I think. But that party, whew, wow. You know, drinks, crowded, music, they're playing music, and you know. Everybody who was famous was there. It was like, <laughs> I don't know, a good word, it was like a, a joke that you were able to see all these people. They didn't even know who you were, totally unknown. You had to find somebody to talk to that you hardly knew, but you knew what they did in their life as far as their business, you know. But 
I was intimidated terribly by all the celebrityhood that was there. And I could not stop looking at photographs and things in the apartment. You know, it's the kind of the apartment that you get off the elevator and you're in the apartment. You know, you just, I don't know, I think he still had his wife, ex-wife's apartment at the other end or something. But it was very posh. That's English, I'm sure, posh. Anyway. Um, how, how do you think, like, the, you know, the art world, theater world has changed since, you know, that? Well, you know, I've been I've been going to theater since I was eight or maybe even seven. And that era was just filled with fabulous actors. Now there are a lot of actors, but fewer celebrities of quality. They didn't talk about their craft much. They were too busy doing it. Today, we train actors hopefully that they will contribute something. Not all of them do. But the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, wow, what a crowd. Thing again, so I met with Morehouse and um, I Chicago. Yeah, and I was born blah, blah blah. I lost a bit about your dad um, and how you found you know the war thing. But we don't have to go into the whole thing again. We just I just love the first bit. So um. I was born in Chicago, November, nineteen twenty-four. It makes me 90. I jokingly say 90 and a half now. On stage, and for a while I was, but that's a very long story. I was in the war, in the army, and I called home to tell my dad and mother that I was going to New York for a weekend pass. I asked my father for a hundred dollars. He said, hell yes, that's all I hear is New York, New York, New York, New York. So go and have a good time. I said, well, it's before I go to Europe probably, that's why they've given me the time off. So anyway, I went. Saw Spencer Tracy in The Rugged Path, Mae West in her play, and many others. I saw Glass Menagerie with Lorette Taylor. Anyway, I was there for the weekend. I lived at the Soldier and Sailor House on Lexington. Then I went home after the weekend, back to camp, <laughs> home. And there I found that my father had passed away. I was so emotionally out of it 
that I remember I put my right hand through a wall and my hand blew up, turned blue. Then I had to take a train to Chicago for the funeral. I didn't have any money, so the Red Cross helped me. I smashed the wall with my right fist, put a hole in the wall, and I remember that the Red Cross paid for my fare, and I was gone five weeks. I got permission to leave the camp for five weeks they gave me. I guess it's done to every soldier. It was Christmas. Yes, it was Christmas. But I was determined, for my sister's sake, to make sure she had a good Christmas. I remember that. Because we had to try and explain to her what happened. And she was the apple of his eye. He had just adored his, his Jacqueline. Okay. Back in the eighties, I wish I remembered all these dates. It's very difficult now, but. I, Sometime at the end of the 79, 80 era, friends began to die. Someone at school, someone you knew in a class, whatever mm -hmm. happened to so-and-so all of a sudden. It, it got to be creepy. And then all of a sudden you've said to your friends, I hear that so-and-so died. He had HIV. And then finally it was called AIDS. And I found myself going to something like 34, 35 funerals. And after a while, you're asked to speak at some of them. And then after all of this huge growth of dead friends. I refuse to go to them or I refuse to speak at some of them because I found it became about me, which was very cruel and very selfish. I just couldn't stop crying. I didn't make sense maybe when I was trying to speak. And I looked like, I don't know, Somebody was terribly self-indulgent. Now we're dealing with dear friends who died. I remember going to a funeral with my friend James. And we looked at each other and we said, what is this? And of course there was this horrible nightmare plague. So I remember going to 35 funerals in what, two and a half years, let's say, two years. It was sweeping over all your friends people you, you know, knew socially or because of business. It's really sad, very sad. What makes me happiest? I cry a lot when I am moved because I hear that someone I know in this barroom benzedrine business 
that their talent has been accepted, and rightly so, and they are a success, a creative success, which to me is very important. I think being now a teacher and not an actor like I used to be, but as a teacher, I'm thrilled when a student does good work. That makes me very happy. When a friend makes me happier, it's because maybe they listened. Maybe they took some advice from someone. And I'm very proud of them. I mean, you have being proud about someone's work and that they're willing to sacrifice so much. I'm just overwhelmed at their growth. That makes me happy. That's why I think when I've seen your work and it's growing, and you know it has to grow more. I think that whole idea of that is a huge accomplishment in a human being. I know that there's level this, level, 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 more and more, and you're never going to finish. You never get to the end of all this study and work and sacrifice. It's like a line from a play, but it's true. Was it worth it, they say? Yes, it is. Yes, it is worth it. Because you're willing to give what you have away and share it. You know, we laugh at Gloria Swanson in Sunset Boulevard. Is that ready for my close-up, Mr. DeMille? He said, oh yes, sure. The need to give it away is very important. You take your work very seriously and you do, don't take yourself seriously. It makes me think of corny as it sounds of Hammerstein. I always do. If you call it a bell, you can ring it. You can sing a song. But the important thing is to give it away something. It's just wonderful. A bell is not a bell unless you ring it. A song is not a song unless you sing it. And love isn't love unless you give it away. It's very important to me. Good afternoon. My name is Edward Morehouse. Good afternoon. My name is Edward Morehouse. And you're a legend. And I'm a what? <laughs> and you're a legend. Oh, I don't know about that. I really don't. But thank you.
your life becomes very blurred because 